Okay. Um, before we pray, just wanted to share um, one scripture which talks about um, you know which talks about speaking and also talks about um, the kind of words that we use when we when we declare and right? speak. So Ephesians four and verse twenty nine it says, uh, "Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers." Right, and it, and then it says, "Don't grieve the Holy Spirit," and so on. So, uh, it's talking about uh, the words that we use in order to communicate, in order to you know minister, whatever. It says, "Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth." So, which means that yes, we can speak words that are corrupt. We can speak words that are you know edifying. It says that you speak words that is good. Those are good for necessary edification. Okay, which means um, it brings about edification, which edification meaning building a person, and also it also means something that it brings about constructive progress, spiritual constructive progress in a person. Right? What is good for necessary edification? That it may impart grace to the hearers. Okay, so there is an impartation or a transfer or a transmission of grace. So what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is divine character. We also know that grace is divine enablement, empowerment by the Holy Spirit. Right. So there is a transfer. There is a transmission of divine grace. There is an enablement that the Holy Spirit brings about. Right. To the hearer. So it says, "Do not, um, uh, you know, but use words that are good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer." So, so as people. You know whom we are, who, who have been entrusted with the truth, entrusted with the words of life. So the words we speak actually bring about that divine empowerment in people, ones who receive. And so, so we just need to be sure of what we are speaking, that it will not tear down, but it will actually establish, build people. But also that there will be this impartation of grace, divine enablement. That happens when when we speak, right? So, just want to remind us of that, um, and then we we can, yeah, we can pray, right? So let's pray. Father God, we we just want to thank you. We come at this day, this time, into your mighty hands, Lord. Father, we thank you for the for the grace that is there, for the life and the power that is there in your words and in your words of life, Lord. We we pray, Father God, even as. Uh, You've called us to be spokespersons, Lord, mouthpieces, Lord, of your uh, of the message of life. Lord, we pray that the words we speak will bring the necessary what is good for necessary edification, that lives will be built up, Father God, in the inner man, built up and made strong, O oh, Father God, to live for you, Father God. And also, Lord, I pray for a transfer, a, a transmission of grace, Lord, a divine empowerment, Master. Even, even today, Lord, even right now, Father God, we pray, Lord, even as we receive the words of life from you, Holy Spirit, even as you speak those words of life, Lord, Lord, I pray that uh, we ourselves will be divinely empowered, Lord, empowered by your power, Father God, even right now, Master, as we receive those words from you, Father God, as you speak to us, Lord, uh, Lord, through and you, as you quicken your word to us in the inner man, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, share the notes. Let's see. Okay, so today we are looking at um, chapter 12, right? Chapter 12. So when it comes to ministering God's word. So chapter 11 was about um, expecting results, expecting fruit. Chapter 12, um, leading people to respond. So uh, this important aspect of um, one is expecting a response based on what we studied earlier, that God's word always has an impact simply because it's, it's supernatural, right? God's word and His desire, His in, His intention in releasing His word, is to always have impact, bring about transformation, and of course, it has to be received by faith. People have to receive it in faith. Right? That's the thing. Right? So, when it comes to um, ministering of God's word and this aspect of leading people to respond, okay, so it's good to remind ourselves that. Um, we, look, we, we looked at the application, we looked at how we are concluding, right? Always we can 
guide people or lead people to respond to the word of god right so they've heard a message they've heard a message on you know various aspects of whatever you know various topics it could be something that you you know that was convicting about you know the kind of life that they were living it could be you, know, you think of various topics that you you know you could possibly share on now one thing is to ask the lord lord how can i lead in ministry or how can i lead in prayer and how can i ask uh, how can i you know get people to respond to this word right it could be presenting a challenge it could be motivating them it could be a you know a word of comfort right but what is it that i can do in order to um, invite people to respond to the word okay so what are some possible responses that we can think of it it really is based on the word right a respond could be a response could be okay um, i i want to receive it in faith and i want to be built up in faith uh, a response could be you know i'm convicted of sin and uh, i want to let go i want to repent i want to change like a response could be uh, you know uh, okay this is a call for action right this is a call for action i've been i've been living a very dormant a uh, very quiet uh, sheltered kind of life but the word this message you know this word that has come today is, is an, actually a call to action which means i need to act on this word i need to do something right and that's the invitation so is a in response you know a call to action so what can i do okay so how can i that is what the application is all about right how how do you now put to practice that word in your in your life personal life but what is the call to action right what is the call to respond at that moment right? is it is it to commit themselves to god is it to you know turn around their lives is it to take certain specific steps right so we need to really understand what the holy spirits who are the holy spirits leading us at that time right so that is why you know just say okay go with the flow of the leading of the holy spirit at the end of the message what is god really asking you know maybe it's a time to invite the power of god the presence of god into a person's life into a person's life situation like uh, maybe the family and to experience the presence and power of god like a breakthrough like healing you know desperate right need the presence need the power of god need an answer from god so it it could be a time to really invite god to do something in the lives in our personal lives in our, in our in our situations right so so go with the flow of what is the lord leading what is the lord putting in your heart right so um we know we we studied about okay hearing the voice of god and receiving guidance from god so we just need to tune in to more of that you know and then there are different ways right where you get people to respond uh, some some ways that you can share uh, how do we yeah so that can be uh, like a, even uh, like a typical gospel message right a gospel message a message of salvation and uh, and we say okay if if it is so would you like to raise your hand indicate your you know so so what does that do uh, you can probably use the so what does that do to people like uh, so example if as a, as a pastor or as a preacher if i have preached the word mm. and towards the end of the sermon if i tell if the lord has spoken to you uh, can you please raise your hand so then i will know i'll pray for you on that particular thing second thing you will know that god has convicted x y or z with that particular word that particular message right or it can also be something like an altar call if the lord is leading you if you have never given your life to christ this is the moment that you can you know uh, come forward we would like to pray for you right right so um, so all this is um, like from the perspective of the speaker right you're saying okay i've now this so i can know that okay how many have you know so so what does it do from the perspective of the listener what do you think um you know getting people to respond and then they are taking certain things from the perspective of the listener one who has heard the message how does it help the lives being transformed correct um it also you know it it also what it does is strengthens the resolve right so you're giving an opportunity for person to do something in the natural like saying okay raise your hands or you know come forward or why don't you just stand where you are and 
you know, all that is actually a call to action personally for them. And it's actually strengthens their resolve. Maybe if a person has thought in their heart saying, hey, I need to give my life to God. So when you give an invitation and give that opportunity for people to respond by saying, okay, stand up wherever you are, lift your hand. It is actually that expression, that thought that they had in their heart, you know, that prayer that they've been praying, it actually gives them some more, it, <clears throat> sorry, it actually strengthens that resolve, that decision. Saying, okay, now I stand up. I'm doing something on it. Phys in the physical, I've thought in my heart, but then now I'm doing now. Okay, so it, it does that. And so what that hap what, what that does is even... Um, it brings that person to a place of surrender even more. Open up their heart for the work of God even more, right? So whatever misgivings they might have had, whatever you know things they might have, you know, half-heartedness was there. All that goes away, right? and they're able to you know, kind of invite God, invite uh, the ministry of the Lord into their hearts. Okay, so these are some um, things. So one is, of course, like you said, uh, you invite, and there could be some physical response, like. Raising of hands, uh, standing, coming forward, and so on. Okay, so how else can we get people to respond to this? How can we do the message? Um, Pastor, even through prayers, we can pray for them to yeah. come to the knowledge of God. Right, right. So let's say um, you know if it's uh, something to do with receiving prayer, right? So. That can be something you know you're receiving prayer so we either they come forward and we pray or maybe wherever they are you know we we pray for them and then they indicate that yes there is a there is a need for prayer there is a need that they have in their lives and so so we pray specifically right for that so so what 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 happens then is that we are inviting the power of god to touch them right we're saying lord i give you permission and i've indicated my need and i'm standing in faith and based on what I've heard right now, Lord, this is your heart. This is what you do. So it, your faith level goes up, right? And you are opening your heart to receive, to to open your heart, life to such situations and uh, life situations to the power of God, to the solution that comes from God. So, so prayer, right? Praying, ministering, and praying for people. Okay, and also we can also minister in the in the prophetic. Right? So we're just waiting on God. God, what is it? Who should I pray for? You know, what are some needs that are there in people's hearts? So God knows. So you wait on the Lord, and the Lord puts certain things in your heart. So you minister in a prophetic way, minister prophetically with the word of knowledge, and uh, maybe the Lord gives names, right? Uh, puts names of people in your heart. Maybe the Lord puts conditions, difficulties, challenges that they might be going through. And so you're able to call that out and people are able to identify with it. Right? The minute you say, okay, I sense that there, there are some people with this kind of a difficulty or this kind of a challenge in their life. So that is, again, ministering in the prophetic. Um, and so that gives an opportunity for people to respond. Okay, I have that need. I hear that that need being mentioned uh, and being mentioned here. And uh, praise God that God knows my need. And because some of these things could be so specific, some of these things could be like you know, uh, it would be so specific that, uh, and it's so personal and private, more than personal, being private, that no one else knows. Right? Uh, I remember once when there was a you know. Uh, there was a meeting, and then, and uh, the person who was praying was praying specifically for certain documents that needed to be signed, right? And these documents, and he also mentioned, you know, these documents are there in your cupboard. You kept it there, and then, so the person was really moved that this big God would know even such minute details of, you know, of their lives. That where, yeah, yeah, I can, go ahead. In healing ministry also, it holds uh, true, no, Pastor? Sorry, in healing ministry healing also? ministry also, as a pastor or as a uh, healing minister, he just says, I sense somebody having a knee pain, I sense somebody having something, yeah, and God yeah. is going to heal you. Yeah. And they feel it uh, more personalized and yes. connected. Yes. Yeah. So so one is we experience, actually, typically word of knowledge does that. Typically, word of knowledge 
expose us to the exposes us to the heart of god it actually when the word of knowledge is released it builds faith in us but also it brings us closer to god we are so, we are so amazed that god loves us so much that god cares for us so much and god knows and wants to change our lives in this particular area intervene so it actually builds that love for god builds faith in in us and so on right so yes uh, so that can also be something you know sit symptoms conditions and all that right so so this can be something so you see that people have received the word uh, they they got a revelation they've already god has been spoken i mean speaking to them god has already spoken to them through the holy spirit and through this you know words being quickened and all that and now here comes a time when that can be put to practice and the and the power and the presence of god can be experienced in an even greater level in a very tangible way right so we should not miss out on that right uh, and and say you know, what can i do you know we 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 don't have to do anything we just have to facilitate but the power of god god will change god will bring about change right so so this uh, leading people to respond in these various ways is uh, is something that we should really grow in you know as ministers of god that we grow in this um yes um god wants to knowing so how do we grow in these things right go how do we grow one thing is for us to know that god uh, know god's heart for people god's love for people god's heart for people god's desire for people right so we we need to be sure of that we need to be assured of that because we see several needs right like recently also we went for some meetings uh, outside of bangalore right so we see some need needs and it's like overwhelming it's like god you know why are people suffering so much you know the kind of needs they have in their family legal cases uh, financial uh, needs to such an extent that you unimaginable right uh, problems with in the fam- marriage and family and all these things and so we look at it and we hear it and then it's like god they really you know have people are needy right um and so it's an opportunity for us to really bring forth the heart of god right so if we need to grow in this area we need to know this is god's heart this is god's heart right for people that god wants to solve god wants that god cares god knows he is not indifferent he cares and he responds to faith and he and he does that right so uh, we we study the life of jesus and that's a great place when you look at the gospels when you study the life of jesus and how he ministered to people because every time we see that he taught people but he also healed and delivered and so on right see he met them at the place place point of need so so this is something step one to be assured of god's heart for the people right for god's love for people and for us to have the same thing right we might be tired at the end of it we might just want to wind up and go at the end of it or or maybe we shared uh we communicated and we're not sure whether it was done well and you feel a little dissatisfaction hey, maybe i should have said this i should have done that no matter what right give an opportunity for people to experience god experience god's power right at that moment when you're bringing things to a close right so so personally also we grow in that area being sensitive to what god wants done right well there's no harm sometimes we might just pray close that's fine but always ask the lord lord what more what else what more and uh, yeah and and just be willing and ready to step into that right okay fine so let's look at in 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 the same thing when it comes to uh leading people to respond to the word of god uh, one thing that we need to understand is when it comes to application of scripture right we are saying okay this is the truth this is how i apply it in your daily life and so we are kind of making it relevant in today's time right some of those things that we have looked at the examples we we looked at could have meant the work situation which is totally different it would be agriculture it would be farming but you're making it relevant for today's culture today's people right so when doing that now again we are coming back to dividing the word of god rightly dividing the word of god rightly interpreting scripture so that the application can be done in the accurate manner correct manner because if our interpretation and communication of scripture is different it's not in line with how it is 
then our application also changes. Yes or no? Yeah. Because you're saying, okay, this is the interpretation, so therefore you apply it this way. Right? So you're saying that uh, this is how you work it out in your life, which could be totally different from what actually the interpretation is. Right? So, um, well, it's not, it's not majorly complex. Some of it is just plain language. But wherever we are, uh, you know, wherever we are, looking at scripture we need to see it in the context of it right when we took it i mean when we take it we, we take just one verse out of it then it becomes a different interpretation and therefore different application like some examples you know if you see if you look at romans 14 and also if you study roman um, sorry 1 corinthians 8 uh, maybe we can look at a few verses right we look at romans 14 Yeah. Okay, so it talks about um, uh, the law of liberty and it talks about things in your diet, okay, what you eat, and how you know if you're weak and then you know you you might have some thoughts that okay this is maybe sinful and I should not, um, and, and and it's in the context of you know he's just leading to okay one person. You know, consider certain kinds of food as sin, and and so on. Uh, and then they're not, if they're not doing it from a place of faith, then uh, you know it is it is sinful for them. So just leave it, right? On observing days, observing times, and all that. So he's addressing this whole thing in chapter fourteen, right? Um, and especially for Paul to say that, we know it's a very radical departure from a. You know, he's a he's a trained Pharisee. Yeah, uh, he says, no, I'm a Jew of the Jews and so on. So it's a very you know, orthodox person who's kept the law and, and, and the commandments and so on for him to say that, hey, you know, this is what it is. There is a liberty. Uh, and he says in verse 14, Romans 14, 14, I'm convinced by the Lord that there is nothing unclean of itself. He's talking about food, diet, right? Saying to whom, to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So, but you... If your brother is grieved because of the food, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be a stumbling block. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go eat it. So don't destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. So this is in the context of believers or uh, two people, or maybe it's a group of people, but it's considering a believer, like one who has already accepted Christ, one who's growing in faith, but is not strong, who's not mature yet. Okay, so, but that application cannot be used for considering unbelievers. Right, this whole chapter, you know, it's it's not addressed to an unbeliever, right? So an unbeliever can do certain things and is does not have a relationship with God and does not have you know is not born again and it is not in that context. So we need to understand that. So our, our application cannot be like, okay, if you, uh, you know, if you do these kind of things, if you observe these kind of things, and you know, it is it is sinful. Right? The application is that, right? When you when you actually consider it for a unbeliever, right? So it is sinful, and or you know, we need to see what the context is. So one Corinthians eight also talks about the same thing, right? So, um, so it is a, you know, it, it is for. All these things that a believer might do and cause a brother, which means a believer in Christ Jesus, to fall, to stumble. Meaning that they are walking and now this is causing them to strip, I mean, to trip down and fall. They are they're falling down. So saying, don't do that. Don't cause a stumbling block for the Christian brother. Right. So it is, it is not applicable to... Uh, a, a non-Christian. So that is something. So, which means that you know, in our interpretation, we take it in context. There are several other examples also given there. So, uh, we're looking at it. So we don't uh, we are careful, right? In what what context is it given so that the application can be accurate? Right. The second thing is that um, you know, if it's if, if an application, sometimes it's nor uh, narrowed down. And it's not a very broad application, right? It's it's given for that context. It is given for that. For example, right? Um, if you look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, okay? 
1 Corinthians 6 19. It's 1 Corinthians 6 talks about how your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? So your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom the Holy Spirit dwells in, and and also said, uh, whom you have, it's it's not uh, it's not yours, right? One Corinthians six verse nineteen. Um, so, in what context is this verse given? Pure. Okay. So, if you look at the verses before that, it talks about immorality. Okay, and he talks about hey, you're actually joined to the Lord, you're one spirit with him. He talks about immorality. So can we use it for, let's say, you know, this whole example of smoking and maybe you know abuse of the body? Yeah, can we use it? Yes. So the even though the original context is narrow and its original context is okay, sexual immorality, you keep your body pure, but you can use it in a broader context. It is valid, right? So now another one, um, let's say, for example, um, okay, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 24. Okay, let's read that verse. 1 Corinthians 7, maybe, uh, you know, verse 23 and 24. You were bought at the price, do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. So he's talking about uh, you know even circumcision, uncircumcision, and and the way they were a slave or a freedman and all that. So that is the context, right? So can we use it to say that hey, you cannot move from where you are. You know, let each one remain in the state in which he is. Uh, he is called. Okay. So does that mean that God wants you to be where you are? Physically in that particular place, you know, because explanations, you know, sometimes if you hear some of the applications, you'd be so surprised, you know, how can somebody preach like that, right? Because it it creates it, it creates a lot of damage to people. It creates a lot of da you know damage in the body of Christ, and we become a laughing stock. You know, others are actually thinking, hey, look at what these guys are saying, what they are preaching, and all that. So, so the thing is this, you know. We look at the is, is it valid? So you know to say no, it's not. Right? It's not valid to say that it's about you know, staying in one place, staying put in one place because this is what it says. Right. Similarly, when we talk about you know some of the deeper things about the work of the Holy Spirit and um, you know baptism of the Holy Spirit and so on. Right. So in and in Acts chapter one, Acts chapter two, we see that they were waiting. They were waiting on God. This one ten twenty were continuing in uh, prayer. They were waiting on God in prayer, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. Right? They continued in prayer. They were in one accord, right, in agreement, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So now to use that as an application, saying that you might have to wait, you might have to wait a long time, you might have to wait on God, and you will have to wait on God. The, the, the they use the old English word tarry. You need to tarry on God for X amount of time in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, in order to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, in order for God to release the you know, gifts. Is it valid or not? What do you think? Would that be the right application? Would that be the right interpretation uh, of Acts chapter 2? They waited for, a, for a, some amount of time. It was not immediate. They can wait it, and and at a certain, on a certain day, it happened, right? So, so can we apply that? Can we use that? What do you think? Use it for waiting on God to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and for the gifts to be released in us. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's look at that. Um, we're looking at Acts chapter two, right? Acts chapter two. Okay, so Acts chapter two starts like this: When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Okay, if you look at the previous chapter, chapter one, 
um, verse 14, it says, these all continued with one accord and prayer and supplication with the women and, and Mary and the mother of Jesus. And so, which means it talks about it, they had already started doing that. They were waiting, they were they used to meet regularly, pray, and so on, right? So here it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one, one place. And suddenly they came the rush, sound of the rushing wind and, and so on. You know what happened, right? They were filled with the Spirit, they spoke in tongues and supernatural things like tongues of fire, all that they experienced. So, if we were to explain saying, you need to wait in order to be filled, right? And we don't know when it's going to happen, but you need to wait. It Would it be right or wrong? See, we need to approach God. We need to approach Him in faith in order to receive from Him. All that is valid. You know, praying, being in agreement, all that is valid. What do you think? I'm running ahead of God, it's better to wait in prayer, not being idle. Okay. So you continue to wait in prayer and uh -huh. you seek God. Uh, he knows the time that He will fill us. Okay. So if we, if we consider other examples, okay, so this is just one. So in Samaria, I think it's Acts chapter 8, right? Philip goes, shares the gospel, people are born again, people are meeting. In Jerusalem, they hear that, hey, these people are born again, there's a church there. They send Peter and John. So Peter and John come. So what did Peter and John do? They come, they lay hands on them, pray, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Here, they are in one accord, praying, waiting. Here, Peter and John come, lay hands, pray. Same thing we see in Cornelius' house, chapter 10. Peter goes, Peter shares, they are filled. Okay, So we see that they're laying on our hands, they receive it in faith. So, so, the, 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 so the thing is, the application, the interpretation, you know, the application is this. On the, the first instant that we hear, you know, they were, the Lord wanted to do something on the day of Pentecost. That's what we see. Chapter, second chapter, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. So the day of Pentecost was like 50 days after the day of the, 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 the yeah, Feast of First Fruits, right? So 50 days after that. So the 50th day, day of Pentecost, is when the Lord ordained that the, there would be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So so whenever they started waiting on and as the Lord said, you know, you wait, you be there and wait till you endured from power on high. So they, that is why they waited. So, so the thing is this, that yes, God can do it in an instant and God wants to do it. But, but historically for them, it was when the day of Pentecost had fully come. He wanted to release it on the day of Pentecost. He wanted the church to be, you know, birthed the New Testament church on the day of Pentecost, because, you know, that was when he ordained for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? So, like, uh, you know, also all these things of, like, waiting on God for his waiting in faith, it's valid. But to teach conclusively that to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, to receive the praying in tongues, you need to wait for a a good amount of time before that happens, that would be a forced application, right? Yes or no? To say that so you need to wait in order for God to move, you need to wait for an X amount of time. It can't happen immediately. It would be a forced application, right? Which means that that is not there in the text, but you are actually forcing it. Because everywhere else you see that. They were in faith, they were expectantly, and they were filled. So there, historically, it was because of the day of Pentecost that God chose to release it. Right? So, so that is the thing, you know, when it comes to... So what happens is, if we were to teach that as doctrine, then that would be incorrect. The application completely changes because of the change in interpretation. Right? And we want people to respond, you know, maybe... You know, Maybe that day you've been talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you've been teaching people about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when, you're, when, you're, when you want people to respond to the message, what is it that you're going to lead them into? Is it for people, you know, everybody's in faith. Maybe people are saying, God, you know, 
today, God, right now. I want you to, you know, bless me. I want to be filled. I want to have the same power to be a witness, to, you know, to to live an overcoming life and, and so on. I want to experience the gifts. But if we were to teach this, that this is how it is going to happen, then we would deny them the opportunity. So that would be the application, right? We would deny them the opportunity when it comes to the time of responding to God's word for them to be filled in the spirit at that time. Right? Because they they would say, okay. I'm going to wait. So, so our uh, when it comes to application, when it comes to inviting people to respond, our interpretation of scripture, uh, rightly dividing the word, is so very important, right? So, so that's something for us to take note of when we are considering, even as we are considering response, right? Yeah, um, there's a question. Yes, Pastor. Doctor. That means uh, God's. Uh impartation is instant so it is always instant only at the pentecost the jesus has to wait so we can pray in that measure of faith that you know whenever we're praying that uh, yeah. let it be instant and uh, we don't have to wait right so we can we can definitely you know uh, and we should you know we should ask um, or invite people say yeah god wants to do it but we also know that people have People have challenges, right? People have oh, okay. maybe people have lack of faith, wrong understanding. Maybe they've been hurt before by something. You know, all that is there. So we just need to encourage them and say, okay, this is what God's heart is. This is what God's will is. God can do it now. Um, so whatever you know, misconceptions about this you have, just lay it aside and receive from God. So, right? Pastor, you mean yeah. the faith has to be both the side, the person who's praying and the person who's receiving exactly right? yeah yeah absolutely okay. so yeah well we know about the gift of faith where it is not on the recipient but is actually on the person who is actually praying and ministering yeah. gift of faith this moves you know one of the gifts we see uh, uh, one of the nine which are listed in 1 Corinthians 12 so the gift of faith is a surge of faith it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter on whether the other person is believing or not, whether the other person, you know, has sufficient faith, whatever. You know, it's, it's your, it's the gift that is given to you so that it can make a change in the other person's life. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Right, right. Yes. Pastor, in that line, I can't move God's time according to my time. No. For example, you're talking about imp impartation. For example, I'm waiting on, on the Lord for uh, speaking in tongues. Yeah, right? praying. So praying. So now uh, my time may not match according to his time. Maybe I've been imparted on the spiritual level. Okay. But on a natural level, for me to receive it, it will be according to his time. But mm. I need to wait. No, I can't say like, you know, no, I want this right now. Give it to me right now. Yeah. So the thing is this. Scriptures, when we look at scripture, when we look at all these instances, we see that God's heart is, he's not holding back. So which means that he's not withholding. And over a period of time, because you know this truth was lost to the church, right? and it's a restoration thing. Now we have all these kind of. See, it was instantaneous, actually. If you look at all the instances, it was instantaneous. Like they would, and this was the model in the church: pray, share the gospel, water baptism, receive. That's it. It was just one package. Right? It just became separate and separate elements over a period of time. So what is God's heart? God's heart is now, yeah, to give. Now, I might have certain things in my mind which are actually preventing, preventing me from receiving. It could be a wrong idea. I could, I could not even be expectant of it. I don't want it, maybe. Like, uh, for example, I'll just share, um, since we're talking about this, like, I, I met one person. Uh, we had this Holy Spirit baptism time. So... Before that, I was just inviting him, you know, come. He said, no, no, I, you know, all this gift and all is not for me. Okay. Uh, I'm all for character. Character, you know, that's the important thing. And this gift thing, I, I really don't want. So, so that, is, that is his mindset, right? So we can't force. We can just invite. We can just expose them to the truth and say, this is God. God's available. What is your heart? You know, do you want? Because God will not force. He's going, he's going, it's free will. It involves, so free will is like a door which opens or shuts. That's the same thing for me also. My personal testimony also was like, uh, hey, that's for you. This is maybe not for me. right? That's for you. This is for you. 
and i didn't really understand or didn't really didn't know god's heart right so so many things okay how it works how does it you know will god like move my mouth and things like that and so i'm not really clear about these things so it was a hindrance right but the minute those things were taken out minus those those doubts were cleared i was just a you know vessel a willing vessel ready to get filled that's it so that is what i'm saying like god's timing is god is not withholding his will is that what we see in the rest of the chapter 1 corinthians 14 pursue love desire spiritual gifts uh, you know uh, so that is god's heart all can receive all can prophesy all can learn that is god's heart right so uh, he's not withholding um, but yeah we need to come to a place of uh, alignment faith expectancy and all that so that can cause delays but not god's hand so that is what we we get yeah uh, yeah um, um. it's on the notes no like nehemiah chapter 9 verse 1 to 3 yeah verse 3 states that and they stood in their place and read the book of the law of yeah. the lord yeah their god for a fourth of a day uh-huh. and for another fourth of the day they confessed and worshiped the lord so yeah. fourth it means six hours yeah yes six hours they read the they word of god that, yeah okay so that's a specific uh, instant in history where the where the worship and the word of god was being restored to the people you know so that is specific time so so we can't correlate that with delay or you know anything else so um, so chapter 9 so in, absolutely yeah 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 for the um once again i'm just trying to see where this uh, oh we're looking at the or oh, leading people to respond yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah so it's about uh, how, how the word of god prepares their heart and then they uh, and they are in agreement we, we read through and then even chapter 9 also says that they are they and the, and the kind of response they had also they they would you know it says that they started weeping and all that and then you know uh, they encourage them uh, and then say okay this is a time of rejoicing isra also we read the same thing right so yeah so yeah that was a time of when people there was this word of god was being taught and explained and so they stood amazing for that time to receive to be uh, you know to reverence god's word yeah any um, any other questions uh-huh. yeah so um so several things like that you know so we just we, we just check we check with the rest of scripture we look at the whole counsel of god's word we look at the context and this actually brings us to a place of um place of wholeness in our interpretation and um, like we say you know right believing leads to right conviction and right living so it has a direct correlation right so so god has given us the word he has given us the wisdom he has given us the holy spirit so we rely we lean and we can also learn from one another as well right so um so that's the thing okay okay let's let's just start um, the next chapter so, so we are going to look at some of the practical instructions practical applications right so that we see and some of these are it's just the wisdom right when you especially when we look at confidence speaking you know preparation and all that it is just practical wisdom some of these are like logical things like right? okay so first thing that we see is that uh, well this is a good news god is watching over his word to perform it to confirm it jeremiah 1:12 talks about that the fact is god is watching over it right so he is the one which means which talks about the fact that he is desiring he wants to confirm he is desiring of it this is his will this is what he wants to do okay so uh, we are not getting him to do anything like all that we are doing is that we are speaking the word we are speaking in line with his will we are sharing the whole making sure that we share god's heart we are making sure that we share god's word right but he is watching over Uh, Jeremiah 112 the lord said to me you have seen well for i am re- ready to perform my 
word. So there it talks about a specific word that he had given Jeremiah. Right? Um, he says, "I you, I put my word in your mouth and so uh, so on." And then, uh, and then after that, he asks Jeremiah, "Jeremiah, what do you see?" Jeremiah says, "I see the I see a, a branch of an almond tree, and and that has an interpretation." And he says, "Okay, I'm going to perform my word." So God gives us the word. God shows us, you know, a prophetic word with the intention of doing something in line with the word. So maybe God has put in your heart to share something to the congregation. Put in your heart, share a message. What is God's heart? What is God's desire? Why did he give that message? Because he wants to do something in line with the message to the people who hear the word. right? So it could be heart alignment. It could be transformation, whatever it is. right? So he is well able to confirm. He is desiring to confirm. <clears throat> now, we never doubt the ability of God. Right? We say, okay, God. But we always doubt the will of God. You know, God, do you really want to? Right? Ability, we know. He's all powerful. But uh, you know, that's that's like the people who are, uh, I think it was a blind person who came and asked the Lord, right? Lord, uh, the Lord asked, you know, do I, uh, you know, do you, um, you know, what, what is the question? Are you, are you, do you, and do you believe that I'm able? Right? And, and the person says, Yes, and and, the, and and God says, you know, I am willing. Right? It's not just the ability, but I am willing. Right? We can do. We know that you can do anything, God. God says, I am willing. Right? So that's the first thing. He watching. He's watching over the word. So we go with that assurance. We share with that assurance. We share with that conviction, and it deeply assures us when you know that God, you gave this word, and it seems like you know, it seems like. Like for example, one person was saying that he received a you know word of knowledge to a person who was like absolutely it seemed to be he was great having great fun. He was the life of the party and all, right? Somewhere in Eastern Europe, and he says, "Oh, I received this word, and the word was like God is dealing with your you know anxiety and your fear and your constant sorrow." But he looks at the person, <clears throat> he's like. Pulls apart. This is not like a person who's sorrowing. This is not like a person who's having constant, you know, is in a place of constant sadness. Definitely not. So you doubt. God, I don't even know. Should I? Should I share this even? But the fact is that when the person went ahead and shared it, and there was impact, right? That person who received the word, prophetic word, this person, he was like totally totally broken in tears and because he knew that that was what he really wanted that was the condition of the heart right probably he was trying to hide it in different ways and so on so that word was shared and there was healing and wholeness yeah yes um, did somebody uh, put their hands up no okay okay so we'll stop here uh, we just started on the topic of uh, you know ministering God's with some practical things. Uh, chapter 13, we'll continue in our next class, right? Okay. Thank you. God bless.